Uh, I'm Roger Prather. My partner today is Dan Thomas. And uh, if you've been watching us for a while, I think we're somewhat familiar faces. Um, it is a chilly, rainy morning in New England. Mm. Wherever you are, I hope it's sunny and 85 degrees because it's not that here. <laughs> um, but today's actually uh, kind of exciting. I'm excited about this quarter. Um, today's the first lesson in the second quarter of 2023. Yep. The title of the lesson is Three Cosmic Messages. Um, and we, this quarter is dedicated to the um, Three Angels message, which is the core identity doctrine. If you had to pick one unique Seventh-day Adventist picture of Christianity, yes. I think the Three Angels message is the core of what distinguishes us. Sanctuary, Sabbath, spirit of prophecy, all that stuff is secondary yep. to the three angels' message. And so I'm excited that we're paying attention to it. I, am I hope well. everybody else is. I didn't mean to interrupt you no, there. No, 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 I, I am as well. And, and it's, I, I'm glad you put it that way and you set us up that way because it's also a very relevant message as we are in these times. We're seeing more and more where that three angels' message is relevant um, and determinative in essence of where we are in our faith. It ought to be. It ought to be, anyway. Yeah. It ought to be. And I, I you know, <laughs> before we get started, just, you know, if you grab a random, this is, and I don't have, this is, there's no scientific basis to this, this is anecdotal, but if you grab a random person sitting in the pews and you ask them to explain or talk about the three angels' message, mm. I don't think we would be able to do it in any great detail. No. And that's why I think that this is something we used to really hammer yes. in the past, Absolutely. and we don't really hammer it um, as often anymore. There's probably lots of reasons for that. We don't have to talk about them right now, but <laughs> um, let's go ahead and get started with prayer. Yeah. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the Sabbath. We thank you for your word. I thank you for the people who are here with us today, either in person or online. And as we study, as we begin the study of the three angels' message, Lord, I, think, I, I pray that you will remind us of the importance of your everlasting gospel first and foremost above anything else help us to understand your gospel and help us to understand the part that we play as individuals and as a church in the spreading of that gospel i ask these things in jesus name amen amen um you have a lot of notes so i'm gonna let try to let you do most of the talking today it looks like but <laughs> i do want to point out one thing because no. i i read the introduction to these things um, because generally speaking, the, the author, and it's Mark Fenley for this quarter, yes. the author um, will give you an overview and he'll give you like little tidbits of information that gives you a clue as to how he's approaching the lesson. Yes. And he mentioned something that I thought was important and he talks about the year 1844 mm -hmm. and of course, we as Adventists understand 1844 because of the Great Disappointment. The Millerites, after a lot of back and forth, um, decided that October 22nd, 1844 was the day. Yep. Um, interestingly enough, we usually, in our superficial understanding of these times, we, we think that that was just the Millerites. William Miller sat alone in the woods in upstate New York and had this sort of insight but though that time frame from like 1843 up to about 1868, um, going as far back as the late 1600s, early 1700s, you had people working to uh, interpret prophecy who came up with that sort of time frame, the, the 2300 days, the 70 weeks and all that. Um, good, good reference for that is Leroy Froome's uh, Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers. Okay. Um, it shows you that. But anyway, he, the, Mark Finley begins by talking 1844, and we remember 1844, but he, he brings up a few other issues from 1844, and he talks about Marx's 1844 manuscripts. Yep. Karl Marx, hopefully you all know who he was, he was a philosopher, yep. and he, his ideas ended up... The founder of communism. Yeah, being the foundation for uh, 20th century communism. Mm -hmm. He also talks about Friedrich Nietzsche, whose ideas undergird uh, 
postmodernism, existentialism. God is dead. God is dead. Yep. And we're dying. And we're the ones who killed him. People forget. That's right. And, and it wasn't a joyful. No. It, it, Nietzsche wasn't saying that with any joy. He was no. saying it because God's dead. We've killed him. And now all of the foundations of our ways of life has been taken out from underneath us. That's right. And we need to build something new. Um, so I guess the, the point that I, I took Finley as making was. You forgot one more. Oh, who else did I forget? Darwin. Nietzsche. Oh, Charles Darwin. <laughs> uh, Darwin, what, did he start his journeys? He did. In um, 1844? Well, he, he, that, that's where he publishes his essay, the 1844. Oh, okay. So that, that was that after his the, journey on the uh, Beagle. Absolutely. That becomes the benchmark for basically the evolutionary process. Materialistic worldview. Materialistic Marx world. very much liked what Darwin oh, said. Oh, he loved it. Because he was a historical <laughs> materialist. He said, history progresses according to material laws, not right. any divine not will. Not any divine will, um, exactly. So, so yeah. and that's an interesting... <laughs> Good stuff. Because it comes right up to what the three angels' message is, history unfolds according to God's divine will. Yes. Get ready, get ready for the end, get right? God's going to start wrapping this thing up. And Darwin is saying, well, no, it, it's just going to keep going and modifying. And Changing Marx, mm -hmm. uh, Francis Schaeffer in the 1970s uh, remarked that uh, properly understood, Marx is a form, Marxism is a form of Christian heresy. Yes. Because Marx says there is a, a teleological end to history. Yep. It's just God doesn't have anything to God do with it. God has nothing to do with the teleology. But the devil, the devil was just as much at work in 1844 as the spirit. I guess that's sort of the point that I, that I took from that. But let's go ahead and jump in. And it's pivotal because, you, and you've mentioned early on the Millerites, mm -hmm. um, which of course after the disappointment, there is, they take it back, they rethink things, and look at what comes out of it is today's modern Adventism. We look at scripture and everything that, in the section we're gonna be looking on today, Revelation 12, refutes Darwinism, mm -hmm. refutes Nietzsche, and refutes Marx, Marxism. So that if you're in this faith, it posits a theological, a God-given idea to how the world comes to an end, as opposed to what these great Western thinkers all advanced as ideas and became parts of government mm -hmm. um, throughout the 19th and 20th century. Government, culture, school, and I dare say, and that's why I think it's important for us to be talking about this because those ideas have also penetrated the church. Yes, they have. Uh, yes, most they of have. the people my age and younger do not have a Christian supernatural worldview. They have some mixture of a, a materialist point of view, uh, point of view. Yep. Um, whether it's derivative, you can talk about who it, whose ideas it ultimately derives from, but yeah, I, I think it's permeated uh, the Absolutely. church. Absolutely. So. Um, our memory text, I sure. we can turn there. Um, as we start this study, um, and again, we're gonna be spending, so, so for the next 13 lessons, we'll be focusing on prophecy, specifically Revelation. Mm -hmm. And so no doubt, of course, as we get started here, our memory text, and the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And that's Revelation 12, verse 17. Make no mistake about it, folks. If you're thinking that it's otherwise the case. Let me be very plain. We are on a war footing. Mm -hmm. I say again, if you somehow think that the war between Christ and Satan, the great controversy is over, I say to you, that is not the case. We are on a war footing. And in saying that, if you understand that, we live differently, we think differently, we reason differently, and our sense of expediency goes up. We are at war. Our enemy 
is not finished with the remnant. And we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit more mm -hmm. as the lesson goes on here. And I just want to let, uh, I know, oh, yes. Mike. Yes, um, you're correct. The enemy is still uh, quite wanting to destroy us. Yes. But we have some good news, and that <laughs> is he is a, a, a fallen foe. Yes. In that through Jesus, we have, we have a, a winning combination. As Amen. our lesson says here, Christ wins, Satan loses. You Amen. know, I, I think of in our country, it's part of our tradition mm. once a year to have the Super Bowl. <laughs> you know, and you know, I think probably of all things, that's better known than any uh, contest that there is. And, 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 and two to three weeks before, all people talk about, oh, this team going to win, that team going to win, whatever. And so nobody, of course, knows until it's over. But here we, in our Christian walk, we are in the cosmic Super Bowl, mm. at, both in our lives and in the universe. Yes. And we know who's going to win. Yes. And we have a part to play in that. And, 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 and to me, the part, one way of describing the three angels' message is that there is a cosmic Super Bowl. Most people know all about the Super Bowl, the football game, but they don't know about the Super Bowl cosmic bowl that's going on. And that's part of the three angels' message. Amen. You know, I'm so glad you said that because um, the title for this lesson... Um, Jesus wins, Satan loses. And Mike, you brought that out very clearly. Um, we already know how this game ends. We already know Jesus wins. Our lesson has it right up in bold on the top. And it's kind of like, I, I was one of those kids, by the way, um, when, when I got a book to read, I, I, I did a quick turn to the back of the book. I read the last sentence. And then I turn to the front and I get started because I wanted to know how it ended. And then the rest of the story would lead me into getting to that point. We already know how this story ends. Christ wins. And those of us who follow him, we win. We are on a winning team. But now there's the strife before we get there. Before we get there, there's a struggle. And I think, too, something that's important to realize, it, this isn't a young crowd. No. Um, and I've always, I've always pointed out, I'm probably, I'm always the youngest person in the room. Yeah. But it's amazing when you, you know, if you grow up in the church, um, sometimes it's hard to appreciate how the rest of the world perceives these issues. Yes. And the rest of the world is longing, dying, literally, in multiple ways, to hear this message because people don't know. People don't know. And it's amazing to, it's st still 43 years old, going to work and talking to people and realizing that they have no idea about the gospel, mm. about sin, about conflict between forces of good versus forces of evil. Um, they have these sort of pictures in their head that's been implanted by the popular culture. Mm -hmm. um, and those who have any exposure to Christianity, the vast majority of them, it's very superficial. Yes. Or, I'm going to get a little old school, it's Roman Catholic. <laughs> and if you, if you know anything about Roman Catholicism, I know a lot of people who grew up Roman Catholic and you know, I, I talk to them and they say, well, the reason I don't, you know, how can you be religious, they'll ask me. I never understood it. And I said, why don't, why didn't you understand it? And they'll say, well, I, you know, I went to catechism classes, you know, to get first communion and all that kind of stuff. And I would ask the priest these questions and the priest would just be like, you know, shut up kid and listen to what I'm saying. I'm the <laughs> priest and you're not. And that's how they approached the, 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 the teaching of religion. And so there's no comprehension. Mm. And one of the beautiful things about growing up in the Seventh-day Adventist church, at least when I was a kid, and I, I see it diminishing all around me. And that's not to be overly critical. It's to see, be, try to be sort of a watchman. I see it diminishing all around me is that we were, we were students of Scripture. Mm. And even if you didn't go to an Adventist school, I didn't go to Adventist schools. I grew up in, going to public school. No, did I. But I walked out of church every week, and every week I walked out of church with a little bit more 
understanding of scripture. Mm -hmm. And so I got, I got to adulthood and, and I felt like I kind of got it. Mm -hmm. You know, I had this foundation, and I, but I see that sort of culture of being students of the Bible diminishing in our denomination. I've talked about this with a pastor before on, in this setting. I've, I've called it the mainlining of, of Seventh-day Adventism. We're becoming more and more like the mainline denominations of Methodism, Presbyterianism, mm -hmm. uh, Episcopalians, where it's, we just kind of, we come here just because that's what we do on Saturday mornings. We come here. It's mechanical. And, you know, there's this nice man that dresses well, and he gives us some pretty words, and he might reference these 66 books every now and then to make his point, and it makes us feel good about ourselves, and then we go home. Mm. And you know what? It's great that we do it on Saturday, because somewhere in that book, um, <laughs> It, we're supposed to do it on Saturday and not Sunday like everybody else. And that's really, we, we've lost that. Yes. Um, and I, that, again, that's why I'm glad we're, we're, um, we're sort of diving into this. But you have a lot of, you look like you did a lot of research, so I want to well, make so sure that we get you no, no, and, your and, insight. Well, no, and this is wonderful. You know, the thing is, I love apocalypticism. Mm -hmm. I love apocalyptic study. So once it came to this, it's like I jumped up and I'm happy because I'm like, hey, here's something that I've spent some time in and I love. Um, plug, and, and I, I was enjoying, as you were talking, I was enjoying it because um, if you have the opportunity to be evangelistic, take this quarterly. You, uh, obviously it's available online, um, but if you have it, take it and share it with someone. Um, because this is, a, I, I did an ecumenical study with a bunch of my coworkers on the, um, on the air base. And what was interesting, they, you know, they didn't want to hear so much about anything else. But when it came to Daniel and Revelation, they were there every week mm -hmm. asking questions and reading and, and trying to get smart about what's happening in Revelation. And it's amazing how the various theological, or the, the various religious groups, they really don't have a concept of what's happening in Revelation. And I see a hand. Go ahead. This, this raises a much bigger issue. And that is what is our job? Yes. As Seventh-day Adventists. Yes. If the world is so needing of this, this information, hmm. why is it not getting out there? Okay? Yes. That's the bigger issue. It's kind of like me as a professor. I got a student learning objective that I got to come, that I got to get across to the student. Mm -hmm. I have to make sure that the outcome is what I expect them to learn. We have all the objectives. We have scripture mm -hmm. as our source. Yes. We are to witness and teach others of the outcome. Because a lot of them are oblivious to the outcome. And we're not doing it. Obviously. And we're not doing that. <laughs> and we want God to come back, but he's not coming back until that's done. Yes. Amen. So that should tell us that we're far short for yes. where we should be right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, 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 and to your point, every week I had, I had to prepare slides and everything. Every week these folks came, every day of every week, with questions, their comments, stuff they had read, movies they watched, books they read. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm not even focused on work here. I'm, this, this is why I'm here. And they would bring their lunch and everything and we would dig into prophecy. Folks, I'm plugging it, but I'm saying around you, there is a literal sea of interest in God's word. And you can just whip, dip your hand in it and you'll get wet with somebody wanting to know what you know. So I say, share it. I say, pray about it. And every chance you get, put it out there. Okay, Revelation 12. We gotta, Revelation we gotta, 12. We got to dig into it. So, um, how many of you, you probably all have already read um, this main verse, this main uh, chapter, Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12 becomes the launch pad for Revelation chapter 13, 
and then eventually Revelation 14, where we get the three angels' message. But Mark Finley, as he was preparing for this, this quarter, preparing this, 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 um, these lessons, um, said, hey, I better take them back to where it all begins. And Revelation 12 is where you need to be. And we're going to read some portions of it, but I, I felt that, you know, before we even got into it, I had to introduce you to an inclusion. Because the Bible does that. Uh, Bible writers have always done that. You'll find them throughout. And of course, Revelation 12 is no exception. What is an inclusio? It's just a nice little literary tool that the author uses to present or to share a point. And it almost takes you back. But he wants to share a point. He wants to zero you in on a point. So he'll give you this little inclusio. And most people hit it in Revelation chapter 12. And they just keep going on reading. So that, let me set it up for you. Revelation chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 12, verse 1 through 6. We read about what? you got some symbols there. You have a woman, and I'll read it to you. Revelation 12, verse 1 through 6. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Verse 2. Then, begin, then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven, and I beheld a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. And his tail, this is verse 4, drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Verse 5, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. And then verse 6, then the woman fled into the wilderness where she was, a place was prepared for her by God that she should be nourished and taken care of for 1,260 days. So you got all this imagery going on. This woman, you can see this woman, you can hear her. She's getting ready to give birth. She's running. And as she's about to do this, you see another sign, this great red angry dragon chasing her. She falls She's ready to give birth. He's about to devour her child. Her child is caught up, taken to heaven, escapes, and she flees into the wilderness for 1,260 days. And then we come up to our inclusio, which is verse 7 through 12. The scene changes. We leave the woman, we leave the fiery red dragon, we leave her child who's been taken up into heaven, and when you get to verse 7, it begins, there is war in heaven. And that's right under Sunday's lesson, if you're following along in a quarterly, that's where Sunday's lesson begins with the war in heaven. Um, we're told... Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, same dragon, and his angels. And of course, he loses and he's cast down to earth. That's the scene setting. And then when you get over to verse 13, it picks back up the story with the woman and her child. Did you get the inclusio? You start off with the woman and the dragon. Scene changes. You hear about a war in heaven. 
That's your inclusion. That's the heart of everything. And then you pick back up with the woman. The war in heaven is the basis for everything going on. And you almost cannot understand the terror and the peril of the woman unless you understand the enemy that first attacked God in the beginning. And then the inclusion ends and we pick back up with the woman and the remnant of her seed. That's you and me, the, the community of faith. And we're still under attack. The enemy loses, but we're still under attack. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm gloss, glossing over it, but that's Revelation 12 in a nutshell. There's a lot to pick at, and we'll pick at it as best we can because we don't have a whole lot of time. Go ahead, brother. Uh, I was listening this week uh, to some, one of the shows and about this, and, and it, it spoke about how Revelation 12 is broken up into four sections, four episodes. Yes. The war in heaven is one. Yes. The, the baby being devoured or attempted to be devoured is number two. Mm -hmm. Into the wilderness, the Middle Ages is number three. And of course, number four is our time. Yes. So I, I thought I'd never heard that. I thought that was uh, interesting to, to look at it that way. Absolutely. And, and it's significant because um, when we get to the end of, and I think I, I read it at the end of verse 6, we find out that the woman goes into this wilderness experience for a period of time. We get, we're told 1,260 days, which if you're following and or if you've been exposed to year day principle in prophecy, which we have for the most part, I know this group has, so, and I'll, I'll just share some references. Ezekiel 28, uh, 14 to 15 is one, okay? Um, where a year, or rather a day in prophecy, is a year. And so that when we, we just, now we can throw out, for the most part, we say year, day principle. But the, our understanding is that 1,260 days, in essence, is 1,260 days years and therefore if we're looking at the timing of when that is that puts us and, and I've got here in my notes 538 taking us well into to 1798 when it would seem that papal Vatican power uh, fell on its face receives its death wound mm -hmm. so that um, looking at things as they progress through the ages with respect to the woman, the church, the community of faith, sometimes also at, at one point in time referred to as Israel. Israel is often in the Bible referred to as a woman. Same applied to the community of faith, a woman. And some folks and, and some religions will even try to say, oh, well, that was the Virgin Mary. She gave birth to, to, to Messiah Prince, but in essence, if you're really going back to the heart of it, and, and, and I'm going to make my little, my little quote here, and a lot of theologians will say this, um, Moses can bring us the law, but Yeshua brings us to the Holy Land, brings us to the Promised Land. And oftentimes, Yeshua, who Joshua was named after, what it was the Bible say? Joshua, son of Nun. So that we understand that, yes, Jesus Christ came into this world as a human born to Mary, but <clears throat> he says, I've been around long before that, folks. Before Abraham was, when they wanted to stone him, I am. So that the community of faith, which Jesus was among, from Israel and to the church now, he comes out of that. He goes to heaven. And, of course, throughout Jesus' life, while he was an infant all the way into his adulthood, Satan strived to destroy him. 
and we get, we get evidences of that. I don't know if you wanted to jump in here, because I know you're quite a historian. No, you're doing a great job. <laughs> I just want to point out why 538. Yes. Um, a lot of people, you know, we get confused. You read different sources. Constantine mm -hmm. was 315. Why 200 and something years later? Yep. Um, there's a specific event that takes place in 538. Okay. Right? Yes. And the emperor is Justinian. And I've got a note right here, the Justinian and Code. Just, so remember, the, the Roman <laughs> Empire has been split into two. There's an Eastern Empire and there's a Western Empire. And Constantine, when he, um, when he converts to Christianity, yeah. it's actually a battle for dominance over both Eastern and Western Empire because uh, the Roman Empire, in, in the centuries after... Uh, you know, you get up to the, like the second century, you start to get all these sort of like invaders on the outskirts and they're just slowly chipping away, chipping away, chipping away at the empire. Yeah. By the time Constantine comes, you have two rival emperors. Yes. They're not really rivals, they're partners, right? You have <laughs> East and West, but Constantine is so full of himself. He wants to control everything. He fight, he's fighting a battle and he says he sees this sign in heaven and that it was the sign of the Christian God he has the soldiers painted, this is the legend that develops, he has the soldiers painted on their shields and they conquer. And Constantine becomes the emperor of the whole empire. And we usually stop and think, Constant, we say Constantine made, Roman, made Christianity the official religion of, Roman, of, of the Roman Empire. That's 100% not true. Constantine legalized, right. Constantine legalized Christianity in the Roman Empire. It wasn't until Theodosius, yep. some quite some time later who made uh, the Christian Christianity the official uh, church of the Roman Empire. Of course, being the Roman Empire, they gave that authority to the priests and the bishops, yep. right? And then you come along, you have Justinian. Justinian has completely abandoned the Western Empire, 530 by 538. He's, told, he's, he's living in Constantinople, modern day Istanbul, full time. The, the, the Germanic invaders are coming in into the Western from, from, from the North, from Germany and the Viking areas. They're, they're coming in to Northern Italy. They're getting closer and closer to Rome. So Justinian goes, to preserve Roman civilization in the West, I give all the power, all the political and spiritual power of the Western Empire to the Pope of Rome because he's the last thread connecting Northern Italy to Roman civilization. And so at that, that's the point where you have that merger between the spiritual power of the priest and the political power of the emperor. And for all intents and purposes, in 538 AD under the Justinian Code, um, the Pope of Rome, or the Bishop of Rome, becomes the de facto political ruler of what's left of the Roman Empire. And to add to that piece, um, and I've got the Justinian Code um, in front of me here. Um, and I'll just read, just, I kind of highlighted some portions of it in red. Um, the Justinian Code was a persecuting instrument. Mm. Justinian upheld the supremacy of the papacy. He, in essence, used the merging of the civic and religious authority for the purpose of uniting Rome. Mm -hmm. You want it to keep an intact empire. And any smart commander, that's what they're going to want to do. Go ahead. Yes, and um, on sun Sunday's lesson, it brings out the point that Jesus, uh, knowing what was going to happen by allowing for freedom of choice in his creation, mm -hmm. knew that that was going to eventually bring him to the cross, yes. bring him to this world and to the cross. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so what the author brings out and very pro appropriately is that how much freedom of choice is so important to God and to the Godhead. Absolutely. And, and, and now, as you, you know, you're pointing out about Justinian and all of these people, what, what happens when there is that connection? There's nothing but a constant taking away of freedom of choice. Yes. It's, it's completely underma undermining the sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross. So then it makes us ask the question, how do we see freedom of choice being eroded today in somewhat similar manner? Yes. Or at least it should give us time, we should think about that. Uh, Absolutely. 
Absolutely, and I'm, I'm so glad oh, you brought man. it. <laughs> <laughs> he just dropped the bomb. Oh. Right <laughs> he just opened up the grenade head up inside of the room. Um, oh man, so, so relevant. Um, as I look at this code here, um, you know, and I'm not just gonna read it to you. Um, he basically, um, he, he adjusted things. Uh, he got in as a theologian. He kind of pushed the popes and the religious leaders aside. And he said, well, um, I, I, wanna, I wanna make some changes here. And, and, and so let's make some changes here. And can you imagine, just imagine um, the president kind of pushing our conference leaders and so forth aside and deciding that, well, I know you guys worship on this day, and I know you guys do this, but, but here's what I want, because it's dividing the empire. It's dividing the country, and, and I, need, I need you to support the country here, so I'm going to change the day you worship, and I'm going to change the what you wear and when you do that. In fact, I'm going to enact some codes that say that you can't gather together like this anymore. That's what Justinian did. Go ahead. I'm, I'm going to... I'm going, to be a trouble, I'm going to be a troublemaker here now. I'm sorry. But are you talking about government telling us what we're going to do? Yeah. How, how about you're going to need to get a shot and there's no religious exceptions? I don't want to go just, there. Just for, the, just for the thought. Sure. It's something for us to consider. Definitely um, worthwhile thinking. Can I, can I be even more of a troublemaker? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> We got to we gotta go right ahead. Right, because that, that, that no religious exemption, I, I'm, a, I'm a government employee, so that applies to me. Um, Same here. But <laughs> how about for the sake of your neighbors, right? For the sake of your neighbors, you probably, probably ought not meet corporately yeah. and to worship. And that was for the, the sake of your neighbors. Yeah. Because you worship Jesus, right? And Jesus is all about love. And well, love your neighbor and don't worship. Yeah. Um, now, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole with stuff like that. But that your point, and I know you, 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 you go ahead before I start talking because <laughs> well, no, I won't Roger, stop. That you're, kind of out, that, that you're kind of working. You're well, kind so, of, yeah, but what ahead. you're setting up here. And we, we, we don't talk, again, we don't talk about these things enough and we need to talk about them more. Right. And not just the COVID stuff, right? But here's the thing about the COVID stuff. Here's the thing about, um, man, I could give you so many examples because I'm a student of these things. You remember the Boston Marathon bombing? Yeah. Um, I went to work that day, um, the day that they caught those two. It was the day after the bombing, I think. And I remember I used to work in Concord, so Concord's very close, you know, it's just a couple towns away from Boston. Yeah. And I remember driving down uh, Route 2 East, and there wasn't a soul to be seen. Wasn't a soul to be seen, because the government said, you are in such danger. Me, in Lancaster, you are in such danger, everybody should just stay home. Yeah. There was nobody on the road, there was nobody out and about. All of Metro Boston completely shut down, and then you, you had the, the cell phone camera videos of, of, of tanks, militarized state police um, marching down neighborhood streets, and people sitting on their porch, you know, videoing the state police as they marched by. I don't know if you guys remember this. I remember it vividly, but marched by in their, with their tanks. BMPs. And yeah. Yeah, they're little. Yeah, these little, like... Yeah. They look like, I don't even know, they look like Humvees with like lots of armor on them. Yeah. But the police are all decked so BM, out in BDUs. Yeah, BMP. And it's I illegal to put tanks. Huh? It's illegal at this point. Well, to, yeah. But it looks like a tank. It looks like it's a, a tank. It's a very militarized yeah. looking group of state troopers yeah. walking down a street. And I, it was either Watertown or Cambridge. Watertown. And, and there's a woman like, you know, videoing the state police as they march by, literally march by. Um, and I remember state trooper goes, hey, get back in your house. It's not safe for you out here. And they're like, we're on our porch, we're fine. And they come up and they, sh they shot a non-lethal round. Um, you know, they have like beanbag rounds and things like that. And they sh actually shot a non-lethal round at a civilian. Wow. And nobody questioned it. Everybody goes, well, yeah, well, they should have just done what the police told them and gone back in their house. And so we're at, a, we're at an inflection point 
hmm. in, our, in our history, um, in this country, and I, we'll eventually get into why this country specifically matters, but we're at an inflection point, and these are conversations we need to have. I'm not proposing conspiracy theories here, but I'm, I'm proposing <laughs> that as a, as a student of government and as an employee of government, that we are dangerously close to um, a, a point in our culture where our culture is going to accept a, a totalitarian type of behavior from their leaders. Um, go ahead, Doug. To, go, to, to, to piggyback on what you're saying, one of the things that where people end up giving a lot of their freedom is when you have fear. When you have fear, Absolutely. you give in to a lot of things that you would not normally give in under comfortable situation. Yep. We saw that with the pandemic. Yes. We see that with various other issues, okay? We have civil liberty rights that are being infringed on right now mm. as well. Because if you don't aspire to a particular thought process, you become isolated in your ability to have that same freedom that the others have. You're also seeing another thing in, in, in this is where you're now presumed guilty before you're innocent. Right. This starts to hit me a lot when you think of Revelation where Christians are going to be brought up into court systems and whatnot, where you are going to be guilty before you're proven innocent. We're starting to see all these changes, and they're very subtle. They're very subtle, where it's almost in some cases imperceptible. But we as Christians have to be higher than that. We have to see through that. And you're absolutely right. I look at the element of fear and how much people are willing to give up when there's a fearful inc uh, incident or things that are happening. And then the government just comes right in and just poof. Absolutely. So our lesson, while positing the fact, and, and these are all ideas, all ways we can look at where the fear, we're on that, that knife's edge of that. The concept is, however, that Jesus has won. He overcame this, and in the same way, we as believers, we, his followers, can have that victory. So the lesson talks about Satan's attacks. He uses civic power. He uses religious powers. He uses various entities. He even uses um, the rancor of those who might cause civic or some kind of distress to again attack God's people. However, <clears throat> and this is on the Tuesdays, it's important that we understand that despite how fearful and dangerous, think about a beanbag coming at somebody for standing on their porch, yeah. despite how scary things can be, <laughs> Jesus has won. And that means you have won. Okay? So on the Tuesdays it says, it, and it talks about accepting victory. And I've got a point there. I just want to read to you here. It says, when we accept by faith that Christ has done, what Christ has done for us, our debt is canceled and we stand perfect in the sight of God. When you share this and you talk about end times, and, and I spoke about being a little evangelistic, getting out there and sharing this lesson with someone, please hammer home also that Christ is one and that you have one and that anyone who accepts him by faith, they also win. Despite how dangerous, despite how scary, despite how evil. In fact, you know, Roger was getting into it. The Justinian codes even had laws that governed what you ate when you ate, he could change things at will. When we're faced with these scary things, think about and embrace the fact that you have already won by your faith in Christ Jesus. You have the victory. Claim it and encourage those who you're sharing with to claim that victory in Christ. And that's a good point yep. to kind of redirect that prior conversation because 
when I talk about an inflection point in our culture, mm -hmm. um, and what you're talking about evangelizing, a lot of people are realizing, they're becoming aware um, of that there's a problem, there's some fundamental dysfunction yeah. in human society. There's something wrong with us, there's something wrong with this world. And if you go, if they go to worldly sources, and that's where Justinian code is an, an important illustration, yep. we look at peace. I'm glad you brought up fear. I have a book on my bookshelf, I'm a political scientist. I have a book on my bookshelf called Fear, The History of a Political Idea. Mm. Um, it's used to control people. And um, people, are, people are becoming fearful because they look at the world and what's going on in the world. At no time, in, like before my lifetime, um, and they're going, something's fundamentally wrong, and they're looking for answers. And what we tend to do in Justinian's code, is a, that's where I was going, is an illustration of this. When we start to look for those answers, we look at peace and unity outwardly. Yes. Right? Do we all look the same? Do we all act the same? Do we all talk the same? Do we all do the same outward behaviors? That's why the Roman Catholic instantiation of Christianity was so useful to the Roman Empire, because everybody went to church, and everybody did this at the right time, and they all did it in unison, and they, they, they genuflected in the right time, and they all took the host, and all these different things, and it looks really good. It's just like a, a you, you see, why do you think dictators in places like North Korea and China and the Soviet Union would have their armies march down the, the causeways with missiles and tanks, because it's, it looks like they're all on the same page. They're in step. They're of one mind. Their commander tells them to turn left, they all turn left. Their commander tells them to go to port arms, they all go to port arms. It's amazing. <laughs> and it looks like they're all on the same page. Yes. And what, why Christianity is so dangerous mm. to that worldview, to that outlook, is that it gives us inner unity, Amen. inner peace, and it's that it comes from that gospel, yeah. the everlasting gospel. I know I stand, I stand condemned before a righteous God. I stand condemned. I am sentenced to death. But Christ's sacrifice makes me righteous before that God. And so all the differences that we share right now in this room, we are unified by that knowledge. Yes, Dr. Merriman. Yes. I'm glad you're talking about the Justinian <laughs> Code. That's easier to remember than the three tribes Ostrogoth and the others too, I can't remember, that they always oh, give that is the date, the beginning of the 538. Uh, and it, I don't know why I had never caught on that, or heard that the Justinian Code was also in 538. Is yeah. that correct? Yes. yes. And why th that's so much easier to remember than these three tribes that supposedly were destroyed in I, that day. Well, the reason why we focus on the tribes is because you have, so do you go back to Daniel, right? You can't understand Revelation without understanding Daniel. And so you have the Roman Empire of iron, the two legs of iron. Some people tell you the two legs represent the Eastern and Western. I don't think it's important whether we know if that's for sure, but you get to the 10 toes and that becomes 10 kingdoms, right? That are, that are not held together. And eventually those 10 kingdoms go on to form the modern nations of Europe, the French, the German, uh, the Iberians, so on and so forth. Um, and then they focus on those three through, so the, the, when Justinian promulgated his papal, when papal supremacy came in 538, the, 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 the Vatican, the papacy was given uh, temporal power. They became a noble, a nobleman under this developing, uh, what, what, what was developing into the, the Middle Ages uh, system of government. And uh, to give him that nobility, he had to be a landholder. And so the land of those three tribes was used, was the land that the, the, the papacy ended up taking over. So people pay a really close attention to that. You know, the Goths and the Ostrogoths and the Vandals and the, uh, so on and so forth. I mean, it's good if you want to memorize that stuff, that's great. Um, but that's why I have reference books on my shelf. You're right, 538, Justinian's Code. That's, but that's where you have the Roman Empire, the recognized political authority in Europe, giving political authority to a, an ecclesiastical body yep. and saying, all right, what's left of the Western Roman Empire belongs to you. You're in charge now. I'm going to stay over here where I'm safe in Constantinople. Not safe for long because the, the, the Muslims ended up coming, but that was a few centuries away. But that, that, is, that, is, that is the 
the three the three kingdoms are prophetic interpretation. Yeah. That is the actual legal construct that created papal supremacy in the Roman Empire. That's what's legally historically important. Because we could debate over the, you know, tribes, well, what about, they weren't really that important. That is undeniable. The Roman Empire from Constantinople saying, the papacy is in charge over there yeah. in Italy. So. Absolutely. It's a good point, Doctor. I'm glad you brought that up. I remember studying about the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, and the Heruli being wiped out. Yeah. And I, um, can I just uh, go right ahead. do one more thing? You talk, draw back to the great controversy theme in the beginning of chapter 12. Yes. We talk about outward uniformity and the soldiers all marching and, and step and everything. That outward uniformity masks extreme, extreme conflict in, in a metaphysical sense. Mm. Right, we can, we can, we, 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 we talk, we, we really like appearances, mm. right? We like to look like, and that's what we see in our culture now. Is everybody looking the same? Is everybody talking the same? Is everybody believing the same? We tolerated differences for a long time, 200 and something years. Actually, go back before that into the English, the English reformers for a long time. But we're, we're, we're shifting in our culture to, we have to be uniform on the outside. And if we're uniform on the outside, then it's easier to ignore all the differences on the inside. Yes. But those differences on the inside are undeniable. And that's why the gospel is important because, again, we all stand convicted. We all stand condemned before a righteous and holy God. Some are given forgiveness because they asked for it, because they accepted it. Others are in defiance. And we hide that defiance versus that forgiveness when we focus on outward uniformity. Absolutely. And that's the temptation of the culture. Yes. So, Last couple of points I want to bring up. As I'm looking at time here, we got seven minutes, if I'm, if I'm following, if I'm tracking right. I wanted us to focus on Thursday's lesson because Thursday's lesson, um, that kind of nails home who we are and where we stand. And that's, um, you'll find a reference, a scriptural reference for that is Revelation 12, 17. It's the last um, verse of um, Revelation 12. So I'll read that for you here. Um, and the dragon was enraged, obviously Satan, was enraged with the woman, the church, God's people, God's covenant keeping people. And he went off to make war with the rest of her offspring. And this is the key point, and we'll, we'll, we'll camp on this, who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Um, folks, it comes down to loyalty. And, and our lesson under Mark Finley nails that out um, in the latter part of Thursday's lesson. Um, who has your loyalty? Who are you loyal to? Who on pain of death are you loyal to? Is it to money? Is it to friends? Is it to something I've understood since I was a child and I take into adulthood and that's what I'm loyal to? The emphasis and the answer should be to the commandments of God. That's where our loyalty should be. That far supersedes any credo or any group identity I have. God and his commandments are first. So that the, the verse hammers out the, that remnant, that remnant community, that remnant group keeps God's commandments and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, you say now, okay, I get the commandments part, but what's the testimony? What's the testimony they're talking about? If you turn to Revelation, and I think I've got it here in my notes, Revelation 19.10. Let's turn there briefly. What is, because it gives us a reference here, and Mark, Mark hammers it out as well. So Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. And I tell, I'm sorry, and I fell at his feet to worship him. 
But he said to me, and this is the, the angel speaking in reference to John, he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and for your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is spirit of prophecy. I've said to this group many times, E.G. White, who in many accounts looked at as a prophet in our faith group and outside of our faith group even, she did not study Greek or Hebrew, but if you read her work, you will find, and read enough of Hebrew and Greek, you'll find she is coming straight out of the Bible, spirit of prophecy. So as you share this lesson with your would-be listeners, nail home this point, that remnant who is in defiance of the dragon, that remnant who is in defiance of his codes and his laws that he tries to put on God's people, that remnant has some characteristics. They keep God's commandments. Number one. Number two, they adhere to the testimony of Jesus, which is spirit of prophecy. Amen. It couldn't be more plain than that. Go. Sorry. I also like what it says in Revelation 12, 11. Mm -hmm. And they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, yes. Jesus' sacrifice, and by the word of their testimony. Now, the, everyone who has been born again, who has had a, a commitment to Jesus, has a testimony. Amen. And that is actually what means a lot when you give your testimony to somebody who maybe not doesn't even understand anything about the Bible. Right. They may be on the fence. What's that? They may be on the fence in terms yes, of their they commitment. they may be on the fence, but your personal testimony, <coughs> has, it, the Holy Spirit can use that more than we can imagine. Amen. And everyone who has surrendered their heart to Jesus has some type of personal testimony. Amen. Because we were all, before that, we were walking the other way. Yeah. And, and then, they, and ultimately, it says and did not love their lives to, to the death. In other words, total commitment. Absolutely. They are loyal. Folks, I, and I've said this to this group as already, and, and, I, and I know you got to point someone out. No worries. Here it is. Each of you can reach somebody, I got my two minute warning, can reach somebody that I probably cannot reach. There's somebody who will listen to you who thinks you, hey, this is a pretty sharp person. I'm going to hear them. Reach out. Pray and reach out. Share God's word. Uh, go ahead. Oh, no, no worries. I, I was just going to point out, Mike already basically pointed it out, that in the grammatical sense, when we talk about the testimony of Jesus being the spirit of prophecy, we, we, we make a big, big point about Ellen G. White, and yes. I'm not trying to detract from what you're saying. You're 100% correct. But remember that we gave Ellen White that, that title. Yes. Right? So we're, we're kind of doing a circular argument. <laughs> but the point to be made about spirit of prophecy, it's not just specifically about Ellen White. What does it mean to prophesy? It doesn't mean to foretell the future. Right? right? It does not mean to foretell the future. Right. Prophesy means to call to account. The church has the prophetic office to call people to account before a holy and righteous God. Amen. Take them to task. <laughs> the way you get people the opportunity to witness is that we talk about that culture of fear, uniformity. It's being, it's being Daniel's three companions and saying, I will not bow down before the image of the king. I'll do anything the king orders me to, but I will not break the commandment against idolatry. And being willing to go into the fiery furnace because of it. And then when you're brought out of the fiery furnace alive, people are going to be like, that was amazing. Tell me what happened. But here's another thing. Yes, Jonathan. The, why, go ahead. But there, here's another thing to remember in that. We act like we're going to preach the gospel and there's going to be millions of people breaking down our door waiting to get inside. That's not true. That's not true. The remnant is a small percentage of the population of this world. Amen. We can't, we, you know, one, one soul is a victory. Yeah. 
we can't use uh, societal standards, general cultural standards. Well, if we're, preaching the, if we're preaching it right, people are gonna be breaking down our door to get inside. No, they're not, because we're gonna be preaching difference, and people don't wanna be different. And I'll let you finish up. <laughs> yeah, along those same lines. Um, so I think we need to be very careful, uh, going back to, I forget your name, I'm sorry. Daniel. Daniel. Uh, going back to what Daniel said about, we need to stand for, and we need to stand only for the Ten Commandments. We, are, we need to remember who those commandments stand for. So yeah. we need to be standing for God and his commandments. So the, going back to um, your... Rogers. No, no, the, oh. um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I meant um, the point of the three worthies. Shadrach, yes. Meshach, and Abednego. They stood for God first. Amen. And through that, they upheld the Ten Commandments. And Amen. that's what we need to be doing. We need to be standing for God. And in doing so, we will stand for what's right and the Ten Commandments and the testimony of Jesus. Amen. 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 I see I got a stop sign. So I'm going to pray with you. Um, and let's close today. Let's pray. Eternal God, thank you for this word. Um, thank you for sharing it with us and the promise of your soon coming. Bless us, Father, as we go into the next portion of the worship service. Guide us as we continue to study your word and look forward to your soon return. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, brother. Thank you. <laughs> All right.